begin the message this evening. Just how much I appreciate the opportunity to come and to be with you. It's been an inspiration for me to be able to be here, to be able to learn from you, to be encouraged by your presence and by your fellowship. I just want to thank in a very special way the elders and, of course, all the ministerial staff and, of course, Chuck in a very special way for allowing me to come and be able to share these thoughts with you. I hope and pray that you've gained something from them and perhaps you've been encouraged by them. I'm very excited about some of the things that are in store for you in the future in a very special way about the coming of Mark and Connie Mancini. Uh, he's going to be a great campus minister for you. Mark is a very special brother to me. I don't think I'll ever forget the uh, time that uh, uh, Mark made his decision to become a Christian. Uh, I'd forgotten my keys that night that he decided to be baptized, and we had to climb in over the garbage cans in through my office window. <laughs> so he's uh, left a great impression on my life in many, many ways. <laughs> but you're going to fall in love with Mark and Connie. Connie's a tremendous sister with a tremendous sparkle and joy, and I know that they're going to be a great encouragement to this congregation. I hope and pray that you'll open your arms and your hearts to them, and indeed you're going to be blessed by having them work alongside with you in the ministry of the gospel at the campuses in this great city. Tonight I'd like to address the theme, the rewards of discipleship. Turn to the book of Revelation, please. Everybody's been kidding me about being a little bit long-winded, but uh, I promise you tonight I'm going to be as brief as possible in the next couple of hours, so. <laughs> the book of Revelation was written during a very traumatic period of time for the young church. It was written during the years that we call the reign of of terror when we look at history. Very often when we think about persecution, we think about the time of Nero and, of course, all of the cruelties that were done to the Christians in the mid-60s in the first century. And yet historians, for the most part, agree that the worst persecution was not endured during the time of Nero, but really several years later during the reign of Domitian, during the reign of terror, if you will, in about 85 to 96 A.D., this letter was probably written in about 95 to 96 A.D., and I believe there's a great deal for us to be gotten from it in a very special way for this church to be able to get a lot from it because sometimes when we go through hard times, when we go through persecution, we have the feeling that we're the only ones that are going through it, the only ones that have ever gone through it. But the good news is there are others that have gone before us and can show us the way to Jesus Christ and eternal life. And so tonight, I hope that this lesson is an encouragement to you. As we look back at the message that Jesus had for the young church, let's turn to chapter 1 and verse 9, and we read these words by the inspired Apostle John. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, John, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. We find right here that Jesus speaks to John, and he says, I want you to write a message to church. And the Bible says in verse 12, he says, I turned around to see the voice of that which was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I felt his feet as so dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys 
of death and Hades. Right here we find the message, the inspired message of Jesus Christ to John. And the Bible says that when he heard the voice of Jesus, he turned around to see to whom the voice belonged. And when he turned around, he saw Jesus. But he didn't see the Jesus that too often we're acquainted with in our Sunday school rooms where we see this weak, pale-skinned, uh, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, almost uh, emaciated, effeminate type of Jesus. This was not the Jesus that John saw when he turned around. He didn't even see the Jesus that walked the face of the earth, a Jesus with bronze skin, sinewed tissues of strength, dark hair and dark covering. He didn't even see the physical Christ that walked the face of the earth. But when he turned around, he saw Jesus, the glorified Christ. When he turned around, he saw that Jesus was standing among the lampstands like unto the Son of Man. He was wearing a robe that represented the priestly office which he held as our intercessor between us and God. He had a golden sash around his chest representing his kingship over the world. His hair and his head were white as wool, as white as snow, representing the purity and the sinlessness of his life. And his eyes were like blazing fire, able to burn through the facade that any man dares erect before Jehovah God. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, strong and sturdy. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, firm and straightforward. And the Bible says that in his right hand he held the seven stars. And of course the seven stars represent the seven churches, which represent the church universal of all time. And isn't it great to know that Jesus holds the church in his hand? Amen to that? That's a comforting feeling, to know that Jesus holds the church. And we find that his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And so when John saw the glorified Christ... When he saw this Christ that stood before him, the Bible says that he fell shuddering before the feet of Christ as though he were dead. And yet the Lord laid his hand on him and he said, John, John, do not be afraid, for I am the first and last, I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive and I live forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. And this is the message of the book of Revelation is do not be afraid. Jesus holds the keys to triumph and eternal life. Amen to that? And so he says to John in verse 19, Write therefore what you've seen and what you now and what will soon take place later. The mystery of the seven stars is what you saw on my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He wanted John to convey this message to the churches. He wanted John to, to relay the message of Christ to a church that was enduring persecution. And so this message tonight, I believe, is, is a very special message for all of us. All of us that have endured persecution, because I'm here to tell you that persecution does have an effect on your Christianity. And the Lord is concerned about the type of effect that it has. And so tonight, Jesus is calling the church. Jesus is calling each one of us to reaffirm our decision for him that he is indeed Lord and Christ. Let's look at the seven individual challenges that he gives to the church of this day. In Revelation chapter 2, we find Jesus' address to the church at Ephesus. And he says in verse 1, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. You know, there's a lot of good things about this church at Ephesus. They were standing firm on the sound doctrine of God's word. They had persevered through a lot of hard things. And yet the Lord had something else that was on his heart. He says in verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Jesus says, in the midst of all the good that you have done, in the midst of all the good that you're doing, and even the fact that you're standing on the truth of God's word, he says, I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. 
Well, what's that mean? How can we relate to that? I think to some extent all of us can tonight. You know, I don't think it, it's very far back for any of us to remember the girl or the guy that we had our first love with, is it? Come on, you remember that, don't you? You remember how great it was, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're in school and you pass those stupid notes, you know? Remember that? Or you remember you finally got up enough guts, or enough intestinal fortitude, if you will, to be able to, to ask her out for the first date. You remember how it was when you're going out and you're having a good time, and, and then if you were a guy, you know, you're wondering whether or not you should hold the girl's hand, you know? That's a big decision. And the girl's wondering, well, should I hold my hand a little bit closer to his hand so he'll hold it, you know? And, and then finally, you know, if you were, uh, you know, gutsy enough, you'd take a hold of the girl's hand if you're going to one of the football games in the fall. You know how it was when your hands started to get all sweaty. And then you started wondering whether you'd let go or not. Well, this was the, sort of the first love. This was the first love. I, I guess I can remember very well, you know, back to the time when uh, I first met Elena, my wife now. And I remember I've always, always cared for Elena. And it's always a very special place. But I don't think I'll ever forget the uh, very first date that uh, we went on. Uh, first of all, I went to the wrong dorm to pick her up. That was very impressionable. <laughs> then, uh, during the uh, football game that we went to, uh, you know how they sing, uh, We Are the Boys of Old Florida, you know, I guess that you still do that uh, in this modern age. Uh, uh, and uh, during the third uh, period break there, and right in the middle of that, uh, her purse had sort of slipped between my feet, and I had Kevin Younger, and you know, Kevin's pretty big, right on my side, and Kevin got a little bit rambunctious on that one holding notes, and knocked me down, and Elena fell right on my lap, and Chuck was here, and Sam was here, and I, I mean, tell you, you talk about an embarrassing situation, that was it. But you know, I, I wanted, I, you know, I still was determined to make this a great date. I still was determined. You talk about perseverance. Guys, you should be taking notes right here. <laughs> Uh, we went out to this restaurant, I, I think it's closed now, but uh, it's, uh, its name is Duke's Restaurant. It's a sort of an Italian spot. And I remember going there, and uh, we'd gotten there, we were going with some other people. And I remember we were going through the line, and they had a salad bar type of thing. And I don't know whether you're going through a salad bar, but they have a lot of different things that you can get. Uh, lettuce is one of them, and you know, they have some other condiments and things. <laughs> And I was going on through, and I was, you know, just making conversation with Elena, you know, trying to, you know, make things go well. And sometimes I have to work a little bit at that. And, and I, uh, you know, back in those days, I used to use my hands a lot to talk. And so I was uh, putting the, the lettuce in my bowl, and I had a lot of condiments that I was putting on in. And I was making a really great point. I really think I was. And all of a sudden, when I made this one point, I hit my hand in the salad bowl. And threw it now you talk about a hard situation to remain cruel in. Now that you really, you really got to be on top of things on something like that. Well, nonetheless, it turned out that I finally did like Elena, and uh, we uh, worked things out. Of course, I always appreciated her wisdom and her being able to judge character. These are some of the highest qualities that Elena has. But you know, in all seriousness, it was, it was such a great thing to be able to, to date a Christian. We just had one of the greatest dating relationships. It was so fun. And then, of course, we got married, and, and it's gotten all the better all the time. And I'm here to tell you that there's nothing greater than being able to date a Christian and then to have a Christian family in Christ. Amen to that. And you know, it's exciting to see the love that you share because your love is much more than just a physical attraction. Your love is based on your commitment to Christ and your friendship with one another. And yet in today's society, we don't see that anymore. We see people getting divorces after one year, five years. Even after 20 years, people are getting divorces or at least getting separated. I know that several of my fraternity brothers are now divorced. And it's only been just a few years since we've graduated from school. Well, you see, this is a lot what the Lord is talking about right here. He says, listen, I hold this against you. You have lost your first love. You remember how it was when with that girl or with that guy for the first time? And you remember those feelings, that exuberance, that, that feeling you just couldn't wait, you couldn't stand to be away from, you couldn't wait to be able to get back together with them. And you know something that's really sad, but sometimes in our Christian lives, we forsake our first love. You remember how it was when you were first baptized in Christ? How excited you were to come to services. How excited you were to be able to study the Bible and to pray and, and just to be with one another. How excited you were to share your faith, tell everybody in your class, to tell everybody in your business, to tell everybody in your high school that you would become a Christian. 
And that love and that enthusiasm was marked all over you, all through the week, you were living for Christ. And yet as time has gone on, and you've gotten busier and busier, we have begun to lose our first love. Well, of course, that's what happens sometimes when there's persecution and their pressures and their deterrence. We begin to lose our first love. And yet, as the Bible says right here, he says, remember the height to which you fought. Remember how great it was when you were experiencing the joy of your salvation. And if you repent, your reward is quite clear. It's the joy of your salvation. I don't believe there are any happier people in the world than Christians. Amen to that. And secondly, to go right along with what we talk about. The other reward I think that we alluded to quite clearly right here is a Christian marriage and a Christian family. There are no happier people in the world than Christians. This is the first reward of the Christian life. Well, let's look at what Jesus had to say at the church of Smyrna. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. These are the words of him who is the first and last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they're Jews that are not and are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, it's pretty easy to relate to verse 9 right there, isn't it? I know your afflictions and your poverty. Can you relate to that just a little bit right there? Sure, just a little. But you know, I, I, I don't think that I fully understood all the implications of this passage. You know, Jesus was concerned that when there became persecution, we would become afraid. We'd become scared. And yet the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 that there will be no cowards in heaven. That's not to say that we won't ever be afraid of sharing our faith, that we won't ever be afraid of... Of, of really giving ourselves for Christ. I believe that every Christian experiences fear. But the question comes is whether or not you're going to be controlled by that fear or not. That's what a coward is. He's controlled by his fear. And Jesus was concerned that these people would be intimidated because of the heavy persecution that they were enduring. But it goes beyond that. And I don't think I ever fully got this. He talks about right here, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. He was trying to remind them of their richness in Jesus Christ. And we are rich. Amen to that. He says, but, but he was concerned that because of their material possessions, because of the things that they possessed, that they would want to hold on to those rather than stand up for Christ. And sometimes we're so afraid of losing what we possess or what we have. You know, I can, as I was talking and sharing a little bit with Chuck and some of the other brothers and sisters this past couple of days, it's been great to, to sort of reminisce on, on how it used to be back in the olden days back here. And uh, I, I'll never forget the time in my fraternity where we started to have a lot of guys my sophomore year start to become Christians. And in my fraternity at Sigma Chi House, a lot of the brothers there started to get upset because these guys, you know, were no longer going to the parties. They were no longer doing the things that they used to do. And uh, it was making them just a little bit nervous. I mean, the word around the house was, uh-oh, who's going to be next? I mean, they were worried about it. They were worried about the situation. I'll never forget that I got called in to the president of our uh, chapter and the vice president, and we had our pledge trainer in there. And, and I'll never forget how they had talked to me and said, Kip, we want to talk to you for a while. We've been quite concerned about what you're doing and what your standing is going to be in this fraternity. And I thought, well, maybe they might lift my pen. I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. And they began, and they started talking. I said, well, Roger wants to talk to you first. And he says, Kip, it is upsetting many of the brothers that you're going around and asking a lot of the brothers in this fraternity, and especially the pledges, to come to church and to come to Bible talk. And all you do, you go around the fraternity house, and you go around, come to soul talk. You know, come to Bible study. And you know, as, as, as he was talking, I just, back in the old days, I had a terrible temper. Of course, I don't have any problem with that anymore, you know, but... Uh, have you ever gotten so mad at something you feel your temper coming on up right here, you know? It's coming right back here and I had to push it right on back down, you know how it was? And I, I was just getting more and upset and you're saying, come to Soul Talk, come to Bible study. And I was getting furious. I said, I hold it. I said, you guys do exactly the same thing. You use your influence, but you use it for a different reason. You're always saying, come to Dubs, come to the ABC Liquor Lounge. And you know, that's what they do. 
People in the world want to influence the other people that they're around to do what they're doing. We as Christians have the same right. Amen to that. And we cannot be intimidated by what other people are going to say and what they do. I, over at the house just there, it was so great to be able to go downstairs and look at the composite of one of the years that I was there in, in school. And to be able to share with a friend of mine says, oh yeah, he became a Christian. Oh yeah, he's a Christian. And he's a Christian. Oh yeah, I remember when he became a Christian. And yeah, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. And it was so great to be able to see the guys that came to Christ. Because we over there decided to take a stand and wouldn't be intimidated for Christ. You know, when we're afraid to lose something, it's so hard for us to give it up to Christ. Uh, a few months ago, Bob and Pat Gimple, I've shared a little bit about them before, had decided to start a, a new business to allow them to be able to have more time to be able to spend with the church. And yet the first few months of the business had been a real struggle, particularly financially. And finally, one night, a few months ago, Bob, and figuring out all the finances and stuff, he had really been concerned about the finances. Oh, man, this, he says, this just does it. He says, I am deciding tonight to trust the Lord. He says, I realize, he's thinking to himself this, I, I realize that Pat and I just haven't trusted the Lord. And consequently, that's why the Lord didn't bless us. Well, a couple days later in the morning, about 8.30 on Wednesday morning, they got a phone call. Pat answered it, and sure enough, it was a call from one of the, the people they wanted to have a business deal with, and he wanted to make a deal with them. And the money was coming through. And then Bob began to share with Pat a little bit about what he'd done. And, and Pat had shared with him long before. He says, honey, I just determined to, to do what you've been doing. And that was really just to trust in God and to let him even take care of our financial matters. And Pat said at this point, she just, said, she just smiled and said, aha, you've been the culprit then, huh? You know, very often we lack faith that God can actually help us in the everyday matters of life. But you know, God has a promise for us, and this is the second reward of the Christian life. It's in Matthew 6 and verse 33, in which Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, if we are putting Jesus Christ first and not intimidated by the world, not becoming afraid of anything we might lose, God will give us everything we need. That's a great promise, a great reward. Amen to that? Amen. The third church is the church at Pergamum. And we read in verse 12 these words. These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. You know, Jesus is saying, listen, I know where you live there in Pergamum where Satan has his throne. He says, you know, I know what it's like over there at Colbert area where Satan has his throne. Amen to that? You know, I know what it's like down there at Buholtz and GHS where Satan has his throne. You know, I know what it's like in the business community of Gainesville where Satan has his throne. He says, I've been to earth. I've been through the struggles. I know what it's like to be where Satan has his throne. And then he goes on and says, Yet you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith in me, even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have taught, you have people there who hold the teachings of Balak. You have taught Balaam to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We find that there was a problem with the church at Pergamum. There were people there that held the teachings of the Nicolaitans, that held these false doctrines. We'll look over in chapter 2, verse 6, and we see how Jesus feels about this. In verse 6, he says, But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This was an address to Ephesus. You know, we need to understand this. Jesus hates false doctrine. He hates false doctrine because our relationship with God is based on two things, truth and grace. And if we take away either one of those two things, it destroys our relationship with Him. And you know, when you get in the midst of persecution, when you get people really down on you, you have a tendency to want to compromise the Scriptures. You have a tendency not to want to make the teachings of the, Christ, of the Christian life as distinct as they need to be. But I'm here to tell you tonight that we need to hold to the Word of God. Amen to that? 
And if it calls for us to lay down the line where the Bible lays down the line, then that's where we need to lay it down. You know, so often we get a little bit of a fuzzy picture about who is saved and who is not saved. You know, if Jesus has called us to the purpose of seeking and saving the lost, I'm confident that Jesus is going to make it quite clear who is saved and who is lost. But so often we get so caught up in, well, is this person sincere or is that person sincere? Listen, sincerity does not equal truth. I appreciate sincere people. They're great. But if you're sincere, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're following the truth. We've got to stop asking ourselves the question, who is right, and simply decide on what is right. Amen to that? And when we do that, then we're going to be able to hold to God's word and keep firm in the direction. And I believe that this yields another reward, a reward of confidence. Confidence that we are following the truth, and secondly, that we are pleasing to our Father. And you know, that's very important to be pleasing to our Father. I know that I'm very, very close to, to my Father. And it always means a great deal to me, personally, when I know that I've done something that's pleased my dad. I don't think I'll ever forget the, the night that, that I was married here at the church and the time when my father stood up and just told all the people that were gathered there, the people that were the most special in my life, just how appreciative he was of what I had decided to do in going into the ministry and the things that I'd done in my life. You know, that meant a lot to me. But you know, it means even more to me to know that my Heavenly Father is pleased with me. That gives me a confidence about my life and a joy and a happiness because I know that I'm following the truth and my Father's wishes. Let's look at the church at Thyatira. We find in verse 20 that Jesus has this against the church at Thyatira. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. You know, for a long time, I guess I really misunderstood this passage. I always thought that Jesus was just simply upset with the fact that Jezebel, this false teacher, was in the midst of the church at, at Thyatira, and this person was teaching about immorality and causing people to fall away from the Word of God. But that really isn't the reason that Jesus is upset with the church. Oh, he was upset with Jezebel. But more than that, Jesus was upset with Jezebel because they tolerated Jezebel in the church. And I'm here to tell you that if we tolerate sin in the church, the world is not going to be attracted to the body of Christ and to Christianity. For too long, you go around and you look on the campuses, you look in the community, and one of the first excuses that you get for people not coming to church, ah, oh, all those people there are just a bunch of hypocrites. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility not to tolerate sin in the lives of people. Amen to that. And I think that the first place we've got to start is with people who are not in Christ yet. You know, so often we once more become intimidated by persecution and we don't want to just sort of lay it out with our non-Christian friends about where they stand because we're afraid that our relationship with them is going to become uncomfortable. It's going to be uneasy. Well, I'm here to tell you that there isn't a person that I haven't won to Christ, that there isn't a time where something about Christianity makes them uncomfortable and even hurts our relationship just a little bit. And if you're not willing to sit down and challenge and grapple with each other's lives then you're not going to be able to win people to Christ. You've got to care enough to speak the truth in love to your non-Christian friends. Secondly, and even more importantly, in the church, we've got to love our brothers and sisters enough to challenge each other. We need to challenge each other about our evangelism. We need to challenge each other about our service. We need to challenge each other about our love. We need to challenge each other about our personal relationship with God because, you see... Our lives are each other's business. We are our brother's keeper. Amen to that. And if we can incorporate that back in the body of Christ, the body of Christ we build up again. We need to learn to challenge each other. We need to learn to disciple each other. This is the thing that's going to rise up the church and make it great. You know, sometimes, though, we, we don't feel like we can challenge each other. Many times we have weaknesses in our own lives. Or secondly, if we're younger brothers and sisters, we don't think that we can challenge those people that are older than us spiritually. We need to all be open because we can all learn from one another. And we need challenges. Amen to that. 
And when you challenge somebody, and they find that it's a God-given truth, and they begin to change their Christian life, I don't know about you, but there begins to build a warmth and a fellowship and a deeper appreciation for one another. And you see, this leads us to our fourth reward. And the fourth reward are close relationships in Christ. It amazes me that many times I can be sharing with someone who's not in Christ, and in a matter of two or three or four weeks, I will have become one of the best friends that they've ever had of all time. And I think that shows just how shallow many people's relationships are in the world. But you know, the beautiful thing is that when we're baptized into Christ, we not only become a son or a daughter of God, but we also become brothers and sisters in Christ, and we get close relationships with people that really care about us. And that's a great reward of the Christian life. Amen? Amen. Let's look at the fifth church, Sardis. In Revelation chapter 3. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up 